Hi, my name is Rachel, and today we have to talk about Babel by R.F. Kuang. Babel by R.F. Kuang was one of my most anticipated reads of the year. I only had three. Um, this, The Whispering Dark by Kelly Andrew, and Blood Mark by Tracy Dion, which just came in the mail today. I'm so happy. The reason that this was an anticipated read for me was because my first dark academia book was Ninth House by Lee Bardugo and we all know that I fucking hate Ninth House. It did not deliver for me what I had hoped at fucking all. I'm pleased to say that Babel did exactly what I had hoped Ninth House as a dark academia would do. In that area it absolutely exceeded my expectation. It, it succeeded in doing exactly what it set out to do. But other people did not have the same experience as me and I kind of want to talk about that today. Mari from My Name is Marinez who we all know I have the utmost respect for and uh, shout out constantly on this channel. I will link her TikTok about this book down below. I think that she's just brilliant. Anyway, so she didn't enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, and she posed this really interesting question What that was, who was this book written for? And as a person who gave this book five stars, I sort of had to flip that around and analyze why was this book for me in a way that it was not for others? What did I get out of it? Why did I get that out of it? And why didn't it do that for other readers? And I realized that the answer is a little bit complicated, um, but it has to do with growing up cult adjacent as I did in Fundyland, in Christian fundamentalism as a evangelical. Um, I grew up that way and I went to a variety of churches but I also attended not only a variety of Protestant churches like Assemblies of God which some of you might know. <laughs> Oh, I have nothing good to say about that. I also attended Christian school for the majority of my educational experience. So I only went to like nine months of, of college education. I went to a technical university for, for nursing and I dropped out because uh, <laughs> I would have made a terrible nurse. You're welcome, health community. But the majority of my education was spent in fundamentalist Christian schools. And I have talked about this by way of talking about nonfiction books, and I've also talked about, uh, I've done an entire video on the curriculums of Christian schools. There are three that are typically used, BJU, Bob Jones University, uh, ACE, and Abeka. Majority of us probably used Abeka, those of us who, who went through that experience. Uh, my nieces right now actually are in the same Christian, one of the same Christian schools I went to growing up, and they use Abeka. Ugh. I worry so much about kids who have to learn from a Becca. I really do because I know that it has not changed at all and I know far too much about it having grown up using it. Anyway, I, from the ages of kindergarten, which is five years old, until the age of 13, eighth grade, all of my schooling was all Christian fundamentalist schools. And I have a lot of stories. I've talked about this on my channel, but I've never explored my lack of education using a fiction book. Let me rephrase that. I've never explored how this upbringing that I had, this very particular upbringing, colors how I experience fiction that I deeply love. I experience fiction, as we all do, uh, the way that who we are colors everything we read and because I went to those schools for so long, that was so much of my foundation as a person, now having left the cult adjacent upbringing, everything is colored by that upbringing, but from like a deconstructionist perspective. I'm going to talk about all of that, but first I have to do the thing. Thank you for being a friend. First to those paying my therapy bills, Eric, Jill, Lex, SJ, Molly, and Zachary. Thank you so much for being a friend. I appreciate you. I needed therapy after this uh, book. I actually, there's a picture of me just having an emotional breakdown somewhere in messages to my friends about this book. <whistles> Yikes. And my potato starch Marxists. <laughs> Aiden, Allison, Brittany, Caitlin, Carlin, Celia, Chris, CJ, Corey, Diet Goth, Ebby, Eden, Elise, Aaron, Gracie, Horror Goose, Jen, Jillian, Jules, Kate, Katie O, Kylie, Marcella, Morgan R, Morgan W, Nicole, Paige, Peggy, Ray, Reba, Sammy, Sarah, Shannon, and Sean. Thank you all. For being a friend. I super appreciate you. Uh, if you would like to join Patreon, the link is down below. You get early access, uh, voting, behind the scenes stuff. 
I'm gonna tell you what this book is about because I feel like this is one of those cases where the synopsis goes right over your head. Okay, so this book is about a guy named Robin. He's the main character. Robin is Chinese. He was born in China. We enter the book and Robin's entire family is dead. He is laying next to them. He is dying himself on his deathbed and this man shows up at his house, kicks in the door, and uses this silver bar to save Robin's life. He then brings Robin to England and has him sign a contract. He's like, you can live here and study language or or you can go back to China and be homeless. And Robin just wants to survive. That's really the whole of this book is Robin just wants to survive. So he agrees. He grows up in the dude's house, mostly just hanging out with the guy and the guy's maid. But the guy sends tutors to teach Robin Latin and Greek. And he tells Robin, you need to keep up with your Chinese. Once he's old enough, he is enrolled at Oxford School of Translation. The tower, the translator's tower is called Babel, which I obviously know because the Tower of Babel is a, is a Bible story and I learned that in Fundyland. At Babel, 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 they use the same silver bars. They create the same silver bars that were used to save Robin's life. They are a silver bar with one word from one language on one side and a similar word on the other side. And there is basically the magic is kind of hard to explain, but there's like magic in translation and commonalities between words. And when you use these words, these silver bars can be used to make uh, certain things happen. Everything from like cleaning water to making alarm clocks sound like actual roosters are crowing to healing wounds like what happened with Robin. Immediately at Babel he meets Rami who is a fellow new student and man of color who was sponsored into Babel. Then they meet Letty and Victoire, two women students at Babel and the four of them become this very tight-knit friend group because they are sort of like all on the outskirts. None of them are white men so they all sort of get like put on like the fringes of society but at Babel there are lots of women and men of color and there they are you know more accepted than they are in like normal society. Eventually Robin is approached by someone from a secret society who tells him hey the way that Babel creates and upholds this silver working for the empire is not right because all the silver gets used by England to keep England rich specifically the upper class white folks. Robin reluctantly starts working working with this secret society called Hermes and eventually all hell breaks loose and there is a revolution at Babel. There's your spoiler free synopsis. I mean it, it literally the title is the necessity of violence or Babel or an arcane history of the Oxford translators revolution. So you know that it's going to end up that there is going to be a translation tra there is going to be a revolution of the translators at Oxford. It's in the title. That's not spoilery. Okay. Okay so in order to make my case I have to explain my background. Um, um, here's the thing about my history education. It was shit. It was so bad, so unbelievably bad. Dad, if you're watching this, it was bad. I don't know why this makes you so upset to hear. I'm sorry you paid for it, but it was really bad. My dad, who I don't speak to, watches my videos. Isn't that weird? We're gonna put her right there, okay? I discussed a little bit of the revisionist history that I was taught in another video where I talk about curriculum. They taught us things like the Trail of Tears was not bad because it led Native Americans to Jesus. Uh, they said, ridiculous similar things about slavery. They never taught us things like the Tulsa Race Massacre, which I took it upon myself to learn about. Last year I read three different books on it, all of which I highly recommend. We didn't learn about uprisings or people fighting back at all. We didn't properly learn about the Holocaust, and they use a lot of Red Scare propaganda to make you hate communism and socialism, but they never teach you what either of those things are. They teach you very little about the history of the United States as it involves women or people of color. Definitely not hardly any any women of color at all. What we did learn was extremely distilled into this very particular narrative that can be summed up in white America is always the hero. There was no history of other countries outside of the United States beyond Christopher Columbus found America and then we did a revolution. Uh, beyond that history was not taught outside the United States unless it was from the Bible. That is not a joke. The Bible was my history book. It was also my science book. It was also my sex education. It was used in a stand as a stand-in for a lot of actual education. When I say in my videos and in my comments that I think that I'm a stupid bitch, I am only partially joking. I'm saying that from a place of everyone else around me who did not grow up fundy has a baseline of education that I did not receive. And I always feel like I am behind. In fact, my friends are currently creating presentations on uh, who they think the worst colonizer in history is. They're doing like a competition and I'm going to be the judge uh, because I don't know any of the people that they're talking about. About. 
I don't have any baseline to go off of. I don't know a single one of them because my my education was so incredibly devoid of actual fact. Uh, Lou, who I've talked about before, um, is brilliant and she is comprising a document for me literally called, uh, I shit you not, teaching Rachel the history her parents denied her. And Alana from the Awkward Book Nerd uh, is an actual teacher and she wants to chip in because they're passionate about people actually knowing history. And I want to stress to you that this was not just one school that I went to that was so adamant about not teaching me facts. Um, I went to four different Christian schools, two different counties, used three different Christian curriculums. I was homeschooled at one point and uh, this was a period of eight years so I know what I'm talking about. My history education was basically just white United States can do no wrong. Colonizing and killing native folks? Justified. The American Revolution? Glorified. Civil War? Hinted that it was a state's rights issue but I don't recall that exact phrasing ever being used overtly. One school, my elementary school, did have a teacher who explained racism and explained what Mel is, which I remember very distinctly, but they teach racism as if these racists were just overtly evil folks and not the literal founding fathers of the United States. They glorify Abraham Lincoln, they say he freed the slaves, but that's not an accurate depiction of what actually happened. They didn't say that he sent a bunch of black folks to Cuba and then they died. He didn't say that they don't teach you that he is responsible for massacres of Native Americans. They don't teach you that post-slavery he thought about having to send black folks away because they were making the white folks uncomfortable. They do this with basically every historical figure and make out the Civil War like, well the North won and then there were some angry folks in the 50s but then Martin Luther King Jr. made a speech and racism was defeated forever hooray! And now it's time to talk about our favorite president Ronald Reagan and then that's it. The racists are never really named and shamed. People like Reagan and Lincoln and Washington and Thomas Jefferson are all painted in this great light. We never learn about anything mean meaningful about anything. Jim Crow South never learned about it. We don't hear about Chinese exclusion laws. We don't hear about the internment camps that we put the Japanese into. We're told that we are the heroes in the story every single time, including World War II, that we freed the Jewish folks from the camps. We never learn about the Vietnam, Vietnam War, except for the one time my teacher said, well, we didn't win, so people treated the soldiers bad when they came home. We never learn about women's suffrage. All we learn is the myth of U.S. exceptionalism. That that is it. The U.S. is great. It's always been great. The U.S. is an experiment in freedom and it's perfect except for those times we had those mean unnamed racists whoever they were and then we got rid of them. We certainly never learn about revolutions outside the United States like in Haiti. So as an adult when I realized how much I did not know over and over and over and over especially when I lived outside of the United States which was a huge wake-up call for me as an adult I started to slowly realize oh shit I'm stupid. So when when I call myself stupid, I sort of mean it. I was kept stupid on purpose because if they can control my knowledge, then they can control me and how I vote. So now I have taken it upon myself in my adulthood to learn the history that I did not get to learn in school because it was stolen from me. And here's the scary part, especially living in a red state like Florida. What you're seeing right now in the United States with the book banning and the crying constantly from the right wing about critical race theory being banned and scary the demonization from the right wing on, on critical race theory though they don't actually know what it is all of that is in an effort to create more kids like me to create a United States where all of the curriculum is like mine it is so whitewashed and kids are kept so stupid so that they can be controlled that is the end goal so a book like this is a warning. It is a warning of what will happen if we allow education to remain a tool of the empire. It's written for kids like me who have their education stolen from them and for the kids in the future who are in danger of having their education stolen from them. Colonization and imperialism happen in more than one facet. This book is an exploration in that topic and what I expect is that this book will end up on banned book lists so that high schoolers cannot read it and engage with it. Not just in Christian schools, 
schools but the hope from the right is that they don't allow high schoolers to read books like this in secular schools because it talks explicitly about how education is a tool of imperialism or can be rather not just in what they do teach and how they frame what they do teach but most importantly in what they don't teach the full title of this book the oxford resistance part is important because it clues you in on the fact that this book is really about revolutions everything in this book is about revolutions how they come about when and how they are effective or ineffective who's involved and this book teaches us about a re revolution that if it were real would not have been taught in my history books because it does not support the narrative that was being taught to me and this is but one aspect of education that was left out from my education in order to keep me stupid i was not other taught other things this book teaches such as etymology and definitely not about translation and how things can be lost in translation why is that because the bible was my history book again and if the bible is not god's literal every single word if it is not inerrant if it is even possible that it was mistranslated then our whole belief system could crumble so instead they got a, they taught us that god thinks that the bible is so important that he would not allow mistranslation we were not allowed to think about translation we were not allowed to think at all so back to the point i was making about revolutions and uprisings <sighs> We aren't taught about them because teaching about resistance is an act of resistance itself. We only learn about those acts of resistance and uprising that meet the narrative of, well, eventually the good, nice white US people will win. So now, as I said, as an adult, I've had to take it upon myself to learn what was stolen from me in order to keep me stupid. And a lot of what I read in this book, which is fiction, was mirrored in a lot of the nonfiction that I've consumed specifically over the last year actually. Things about uprisings and protests and war and revolutions. For instance, I think that this book is a great book to read as a companion to really specifically two other books for those of us who are trying to sort of like reclaim our education and do better for our kids. To be honest, I think that people would get more out of this book if they stopped looking at it as fiction, looking at it as fiction and start looking at it as if it is creative nonfiction. There's a reason why Rebecca's list of reading material that she put out uh, that helped her create this book looks like this. Again, there's two other books that I think read in tandem, all three of them together, uh, actually specifically if you read the the two nonfictions first and then read this I feel like people will get more out of the conversations that Rebecca was trying to have in this book so a book that is nonfiction that I think because I read it I had a more rich experience with Babel was the nonfiction graphic novel by here I'll put this down was a nonfiction graphic novel book by Dr. Rebecca Hall called Wake the Hidden History of slave revolts uh women-led slave revolts rather and dr hall is discussing something that in general does not get discussed in the typical curriculum especially not in fundy curriculum but she's doing something important in this graphic novel by not just literally showing you because it's graphic novel her experiences trying to go and get these records of women-led slave revolts which even now she experienced pushback from the businesses that still have these records from when they owned slaves but she did something very important by trying to human the stories using what uh, cultural and historical context, context she knows as a you know professor as a professional where she writes in dialogue and actual story into these historical accounts that don't have it in order to sort of reclaim the humanity of these women slaves who revolted she gave them back their humanity that was lost to history i think that that is so incredibly important that she did that and in kuang's babel when the translator's revolution happens you see in real time the attempted dehumanization of the revolutionaries you see that in you know the the, the news they are attempting to dehumanize and vilify the translators who are revolting and how that is an active effort by those in power to undermine the cause in the hopes that it would garner no support and be lost to history. Another piece that reflects real world importance surrounding revolutions is solidarity movements and of course what book does a better job of outlining <laughs> uh, in simple language for stupid bitches like me the importance of an existence of global international solidarity movements uh, but freedom is a constant struggle by Angela Davis. Babel makes it very clear in a fictional format how empire is a spider web that is far-reaching and interconnected. Angela Davis does this in freedom as a constant struggle but then also follows it up with how solidarity movements are similar. Solidarity movements are interconnected they are internationally connected. 
She takes the idea, that quote by Dr. King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. She takes it in that book and elevates it to injustice anywhere is inextricably linked to injustice everywhere, but so is solidarity among the oppressed. She discusses solidarity between Palestinians, for instance, and those who protested in Ferguson, how they helped each other deal with violence during protest from the police, but also talks about that spider web of imperialism that she doesn't really use the term spider web, but that's how I imagine it, that spider web of imperialism that is far reaching yet interconnected and she illustrates that by discussing the connections between the military and prison industrial complex in the US and similar oppressive forces in Israel and the IDF. In Babel this is shown by the fact that Oxford works on behalf of the empire as does the military. Though Oxford was not the seat of power it produced the occupants thereof. Its alumni ran the empire. Someone perhaps this moment was rushing to Oxford station with news of the occupation. Someone would recognize its significance, would see that it was not a petty student's game, but a crisis of international importance. Someone would get this in front of the cabinet and house of lords. The parliament would show what happened next. So you can see that Oxford is not divorced from the empire. It works for the empire. So anything going on at Oxford is directly controlled by and impacted by Parliament. And they can send the military, for instance, and did if a revolution happens at Oxford. But solidarity movements exist in the book too and I think Rebecca choosing to add that was so incredibly important and brilliant so it says it here where British workers came to aid the Oxford translators who were revolting they created barricades and Victoire asks what are you out here protesting and the worker said the silver industrial revolution of course turns out we're on the same side and she says we are and he says certainly where industry is concerned we've been trying to convince you of the same and it's this brilliant moment where you realize that the solidarity movement is is going to be the thing that makes all the difference in this revolution whether they win or lose the solidarity movement is important again i got so much more out of the story because i saw direct links to the brilliant nonfiction work that has taught me so much like Dr. Rebecca Hall's work and Angela Davis's works. Without reading those first I'm not sure that I would have gotten as much out of Babel as I did. So to make a long story short this book is for me and it's for anyone about it's it's for anyone who's passionate about having a greater understanding of history in regards to imperialism and student uprisings and solidarity movements in general and how revolutions happen. I think that when she said this is a tonal response to the secret history she was saying that this book unlike the secret history deeply investigates how academia cannot be divorced from the fact that it is a tool of empire. This book is for anybody who wants to in their own way resist the imperialism being attempted now. There's been a lot of chat also about the characters and how people feel like they were mouthpieces. I've seen five, no lie, five separate reviews all call these characters mouthpieces. I disagree. I just feel like there was a focus in on Robin and there were footnotes that definitely should have been their own chapters. There's a lot of footnotes in this and I really enjoyed the way that she chose to utilize them but I can see how that would not be for everybody. I think that those some of those footnotes should have been their own chapters in order for people to get what they were hoping to get out of certain characters but for me I just really appreciate what Rebecca Kwong was trying to do in terms of like using different characters to make like a uh, example of some people being two sides of the same coin. I mean, this is going to get spoiler for like one minute. Um, so if you don't want spoilers, mute me until this spoiler warning is gone. The whole two sides of the same coin thing, I think comes into play with Letty and Professor Kraft, but mostly with Griffin and Robin. So in the case of like Professor Kraft, she starts out the book saying like, oh, any woman could be at Oxford. Uh, it, it's, it's because of meritocracy, failing to like take into account how her whiteness got her there. Her and Letty both were dealing with misogyny, but still believed in meritocracy and when presented with information that upset this worldview Letty chose one path <laughs> terribly and Professor Kraft chose a different path. Letty chooses to uphold empire whereas Professor Kraft chooses to reflect and do the right thing even though it leads to her death. But Robin and Griffin are truly the best example of this whole two sides of the same coin thing that I think Rebecca was trying to do because Robin was just Griffin's replacement. The professor sired both of them and they were so similar but so different. Griffin forgets Chinese. 
Robin doesn't want to remember Chinese. Griffin was alone after he murdered somebody and did not have that cohort of friends to uh, lean on. Whereas Robin killed someone and had a great group of friends to lean on. Robin was trying to forget his roots. Griffin, Griffin was always trying to reconnect with his roots and he needed Robin in order to reconnect with those roots. And Robin didn't realize that Griffin was his connection to his roots. In the end, there was only agency for either of them in death and they sort of became almost one person, but it was the opposite of the one person that the professor had tried to create and instead he created his own downfall. I think a lot of people, I saw a lot of people saying that they felt like the changes in Robin happened very suddenly, almost like a Daenerys Targaryen type thing, but I don't see it that way. What the fuck? Where did I put the book? Even in when I was mapping it out, I used blue tabs to sort of map out Robin's trajectory and it all made perfect sense to me, but to me this book hit the mark in every possible way. It did what it set out to do as far as Robin as a character in my opinion, and its main purpose was really to discuss imperialism and revolutions and what that, and to sort of like humanize the people who engage in revolts. And I think that this is one of the most important things that I've ever read. But I think that that is because of my upbringing. I think that that is purely because of where I am now in life, where I was when I was learning history, where I am now as a person who's trying to regain the historical knowledge that I was barred from having as a kid. And I think that this this helped me be a better book reviewer because it reminded me that book, or, book experiencing a book is so subjective and so deeply tied to who we are as a person. It also helped me because etymology <laughs> is something I know very little about and it helped me to learn that there really is so many words that I don't even know are anachronistic such as like the word tabby cat um, that comes from a very particular place so really any fantasy book using the word tabby cat that would be anachronistic so it taught me to be a little bit less less of a hard ass about anachronisms in like fantasy books the etymology is all green Robin is all blue anything about imperialism I thought was important is purple. There was a system. That's how important this book was to me. Normally I'm just like, make a rainbow! Anyway, I loved this book. As you can see, this is one of the most important things I've ever read in my life. Thank you to my brother for, well, he doesn't watch YouTube, but thanks anyway to my brother for buying me a copy. So I know that some of you will disagree and I'm okay with that. This is one of those times when I love a book enough for other people and I don't need other people to love it because it's so important to me. It's not one of those books where I'm like, this was so great, I don't understand why don't you like it? I do understand why you don't like it and I love it enough for both of us <laughs> and I'm totally okay with that. Like I understand anybody who gave this three stars. I get it. I, I now I get it very deeply because I understand that this was deeply personal to me. What I don't get is the people who DNF'd it after 100 pages and then gave it one star and said that it was racist towards white people. That I don't get. Everybody else it's fine. Is that rain? Well that feels racist towards white people. That's not a thing. Okay anyway thank you so much for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below. Let me know if you enjoyed Babel or if you had a hard time with it or if you got as much out of it as I did. If you are a fellow former Fundy kid, I cannot recommend this highly enough to you. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you let me know if you are, but if you are a fellow, fellow former Fundy kid who is passionate about learning history now, let me know because I would love to talk to you. I mean, I'm cool with talking to anybody, but I, I deeply appreciate former Fundy kids who, like me, are reclaiming our education. Okay? Okay. I guess that's it. Check out Patreon and be sure to pick up Babel by RF Kwong. Okay? Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye!